All right. Thank you, Deidre. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everybody. Everybody online from all these different states we heard about. And here in, we have a nice group here inside the Yankton Community Library. I won't speak too long. I will turn it over to Dr. Rich Loftus. He's a history professor at Montmartre University, which is here in Yankton. He's our local and resident World War I expert. He'll talk about South Dakota experiences, discuss his latest book. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, <clears throat> Jeremy, Jeremy and I are and I are good friends because he was a sports writer for a long time. So we stood next to each other on the sidelines because I photographed athletics. So soccer double headers. Mm -hmm. we, we made it. Mm -hmm. So thanks for coming out tonight. Um, one time when I was teaching a summer course, I came in on a Monday and there was a shoe box on my front desk. And it had a bunch of World War One era correspondence uh, that led me to write a story about Edward Harris from Armour, South Dakota, who went off and fought for the United States in World War One. And this family, the uh, Warrens family, read that story in South Dakota history, and uh, we eventually got in contact with each other. And I went up to Aberdeen, and as you can see from their display, they had quite a collection of World War I memorabilia. And they went down in the basement and they brought up a stack of correspondence and they set it on the kitchen table. And it was about as high as this podium. Now I'm looking at that and I'm just going, oh, what is in there? Now the problem was that on the top, his father, had written private, not for public viewing. So Marvin turned to his wife, Leona, and said, what do you think? And then I got my biggest break ever as a historian. They decided to untie the knot and let me tell the story. So that's how I got access to the story. And I've, I've been presenting and writing about it now for 20 years. This is the 20th anniversary of being able to tell this story. So here's the family. Uh, John is in the back right up here. Um, here's Anna, his sister. You're going to hear a lot from her tonight. Both of the parents had deep connections to the country of Germany. So they were Missouri Synod Lutherans. When they went to church in Wentworth, they worshipped in German. When they went to elementary school, they were educated in the German language. They spoke German sometimes at home, and they even wrote letters to each other uh, in German. So when the war starts in 1914, their natural inclination would be to pull for Germany. Now, if you were from, if you had relatives in France or England, you might be pulling for the other side. But America was neutral in 1914. So you didn't have to navigate that big question quite yet. Now, the first letter in this sequence comes from 1916. So one of the things that John was engaged in was stamp collecting, and he had a, a stamp collecting friend, Gil, from Grand Forks, North Dakota. I'm going to have to see if I can read the words that are behind the, uh, the boxes there. So he'd been gone for a long time. And he's writing to John to explain why John hasn't seen him for a long time. And the reason is he had an uncle who was in the German military. And so that uncle invited Gil to go over, join the Germans. So he'd been on the front lines. And he writes, uh, war is all right in a way, but I inclined, I'm inclined to think that Sherman slandered hell when he compared it to war. I'm inclined that the devil would blush with some of the things that are perpetrated in the name of war. I never in my worst imaginings pictured war as bad as it really is. So he goes to Brussels and he sees the king of Germany and he's all excited. Uh, he's patriotic. So Gill is definitely pro-German. Now we know from diagrams in the letter by the way, 
This letter was 18 pages long, handwritten, and single spaced. So when these people wrote letters, they were serious. If they wrote a letter that was only four or five pages long, they apologized. So in this letter, Gill has diagrams of the battles that he participated in. And I know from secondary sources, this is where Adolf Hitler fought. So it's conceivable that he and uh, Gill rubbed shoulders. Now, after 18 pages, he says, don't tell anybody where I was. I'm trying to get a job in the post office. And so by 1916, uh, our attitudes towards Germany were beginning to deteriorate because in May of 1915, the Lusitania had been sunk and Gil doesn't want anyone to know that he was over in Germany. Now, unfortunately for me, he doesn't sign his last name. I'm still trying to find out what his last name was. All I have is the address from which he wrote the letter. Now, there was a, an insurgent democratic movement that got started primarily in North Dakota. It was called the Nonpartisan League. So it was a bunch of farmers. And what they said was, look, rather than send our grain to Minneapolis and have it ground into flour there, maybe we should have a state mill and elevator and not have to pay to ship our grain all the way to Minneapolis. Maybe we should have a state bank that has lower interest rates for us. So um, John Warrens and his dad were members of the nonpartisan league when it tried to get started in South Dakota. And uh, it was not well received in South Dakota. So one of the problems was that they were labeled as socialists or reds. And uh, they, a lot of them tended to be against U.S. involvement in the war. So no less a figure than Teddy Roosevelt wrote editorials in Kansas City newspapers in which he claimed erroneously that the leaders of this NPL were taking their orders from Lenin and Trotsky from the Russian Revolution. So this is a way to smear the NPL and, uh, you know, hamper its progress by just labeling them Bolsheviks. And so what Roosevelt is saying is if you let these guys have political power, they'll turn, they'll do the same kind of evil things that happened in Russia. They'll do those in the United States. So this all got caught up in the first Red Scare in the, in the United States in 1919, 1920. Now, what sometimes happened is uh, outright violence perpetrated against members of the NPL. So when they tried to have a meeting in Wentworth, South Dakota, which is just east of Madison, South Dakota, about 100 miles north of here, uh, the authorities in the city would not let them use the city hall. So their right of assembly was denied. And uh, there were instances in South Dakota and Minnesota of nonpartisan league members being tarred and feathered. So this guy was from Laverne, Minnesota, and the perpetrators of this harassment were put on trial. They were found not guilty, and they had a big party in Laverne, Minnesota, celebrating the fact that they were not guilty. So this was a time with a lot of uh, political unrest. And I didn't think that tarring and feathering had lasted into the 20th century until I read, you know, until I did the research for this book. Now, everything's going to change in April of 1917. The United States, for a number of reasons, will decide to enter the war against Germany. And what Wilson said in his war address, asking Congress to declare war, we're going to war to make the world safe for democracy. Now, this was one of the most important speeches a president ever made, uh, in case you don't realize that we've been doing that ever since, going around the world, trying to transform places into democracies. We haven't had a lot of luck. So it goes back to Wilson with this kind of messianic idea of America's role in the world. 
So this is a, a female friend, Ida, and she's writing to John and she says, you know, when the war started, I was pro-German because that's the connection that we have to that country. But now we're fighting for something different. We're fighting for a principle. We're fighting to make the world safe for democracy. So she's made the switch. So once, you know, the United States went to war against Germany, if you were an American of German ancestry, you had to make a choice. Were you going to be a loyal American? Or would you, you know, secretly pull for the other side? Now, <clears throat> John gets drafted and he heads off to Camp Funston in Kansas for basic training. Young men went there, 18, 19, 20 years old, and they might be perfectly healthy. They'd get sick and their lungs would fill with fluid and they would die in three days. This is that big flu epidemic that spread around the globe. Uh, it killed a lot of people around the world. You can see 50 million. And the American, one of the American versions of it happened at Camp Funston in Kansas. Here he is, here's his helmet from World War I. These people are, the Warren's family were genealogical researchers, so they were great in preserving things. So when people talk about doing research, they often talk about how heroic it was and, and to travel and go to this archive and that archive. archive. My research got delivered to me in the mail. Now, what we do, when we declare war in 1917, we have to build an army. We only have just over 100,000 men in the army. Eventually, we're going to send 2 million men to fight in World War I. So imagine going from basically scratch to feeding, training, clothing, um, arming all those people. It didn't go well. So here he says, uh, I have my uniform now, and you wouldn't even know me. I got shots in the arm. I feel like I whipped dog with a can on my tail. Damn those injections. That's another personal thing I've got against the Kaiser now. Now here's the sarcasm. I got a good fit all around. My drawers are 36. I wear 44. My shirt's a 44. I wear 42. My pants are a little better, but my blouse is a 40. Four sizes too small, as are my shoes. Oh, it's great. Now, the Warrens family lived on a farm. When they went to grocery shopping, they could go into Wentworth, just a few miles away. Madison, Madison was about six miles away, and they'd probably been to Sioux Falls. Now, here, here we have, you know, young men from rural South Dakota, and they're going to go to New York, and Paris, and he talks about seeing the Brooklyn Bridge and the Statue of Liberty. How thrilling that was. But all along in his letters, uh, he always said that South Dakota was the best place, didn't matter where it was. And here he talks about uh, he's in the machine gun company. He was in the 355th Infantry of the 89th Division. Uh, his job was to make sure the ammunition was getting to the machine gun in a proper way. And he's all excited. And he says, uh, the Kaiser's gonna have to move by force. We've got some hard boiled guys in this outfit. And I'm afraid I'll be a hard boiled guy before I get back. We have a bunch of great sergeants that every man in the company would stick to until the last. So here you have the bravado of the new recruit. Now, he's gonna be sent off after only one month of training. So you go from the farm, to Camp Funston, 30 days off to war. A lot of these guys trained with wooden guns. So, <clears throat> propaganda reached new heights in this war. What England did is, when the war started, 
they cut every transatlantic cable between Europe and the United States, except the one from Great Britain to the United States. So they basically control the flow of information. And they talked about the atrocities that the Germans were committing, especially when they went through neutral Belgium, you know, stabbing babies with bayonets and twirling them in the air, raping and pillaging. And they referred to the Germans as the Huns. Okay. So here's, you know, an American poster. We have to halt the Hun. Now, this is one of my favorite letters. This is his, his sister, Anna. It's June, 1918. And she's been to Madison to see a movie. And movies were brand new. I mean, when people saw a moving picture, they thought it was real. It made a huge impression. So here we go. I mentioned in my letter yesterday that RA was gonna take me to see Over the Top at Madison. Well, we went, Laura Agnes, myself, and R.A. in such a show. I wouldn't take a million for the two hours spent there. I thought the birth of a nation was good, but this was great. There hasn't anything affected me as that or the play did for ages. She means movie. Hope you'll have the honor of going over the top as Gary did. Now, that's the last thing you'd want your brother to do is charge out of a trench directly into German machine gun fire. Saw a machine gun in motion. Some little cracker jack, ain't it? I'm wishing all the time now that I were a boy. Bet your book I'd be with the colors. By July, I'm going to get a chance to get in this last Red Cross nurse call. But don't ask any questions, as this is a secret between you and me. You know what I mean, don't you? RA is an alternate and will probably go anyway. On Friday, he wants to awfully bad. Gee, I can't keep my thoughts from the play, she means movie. I wish I could give you a full account of it. Those darn German officers would like to have had a chance to kill some of them. Agnes said she was so mad, she would have shot at the screen had she had a revolver. A play like that one is worth seeing. I want the folks to go tonight, but I don't know whether they will or not. I remain, lovingly, Sister Tommy. P.S. When you get ready to shoot some grape shot at the Huns with the machine gun, give them an extra dose for me. One time at the conference in Fargo, the commentator said, they should have sent Anna to the restaurant. <laughs> now, they worshiped in German, went to school in German, spoke German at home, wrote letters in German, but now who are the Germans? They're the Huns. The, the propaganda had reached all the way to rural South Dakota. That is an incredible letter. Here's Anna with one of her friends. They like to dress up in uniforms and smoke a cigarette now and then. I had two of her nieces come back for one of these presentations and they, they didn't know all this stuff about it. Here's Walter, younger brother, the farmhouse in the background. He's got a rabbit and he says in the back, I shot this rabbit and skinned it. It weighed eight pounds. We ate the meat and I sold the skin for 20 cents. Now, South Dakota, not unlike other parts of the country, went to absurd lengths to demonstrate patriotism. It was illegal to speak in German on the phone. That one we can kind of understand, but here's the one that is outrageous. The teaching of all foreign languages was declared illegal. Not just German, all foreign languages. So we used to have a Rhine Creek that ran through Yankton, but if you're going to go to war against Germany, you don't want to have that, so we changed it to the Marne. So there were two battles of the Marne that kept the Germans from taking over Paris. Now, Yankton high school kids 
broke into the high school, gathered up all the German language textbooks, threw them in the Missouri River. They smeared yellow paint across German churches, schools, and teachers' homes. There were rarely any arrests. And after they dumped the books in the river, they walked around downtown singing patriotic songs, and they were considered heroic. Now, in Wentworth, when you bought a bond to support the war, your name would appear in the front page of the newspaper. Someone was keeping track. So if your name didn't appear, you might wake up one morning and the front of your barn might be painted yellow, the color of cowardice. It happened to the German Lutheran school in Wentworth. Now, the paper said, if you look in the middle, there, many are of the opinion that it was done by out-of-town parties. So on, on September 23rd, I did this in Madison, and I've been waiting for 20 years to say that line. It must have been somebody from Madison. <laughs> Nobody from Wentworth would ever do this. And then they did say, you know, hey, we're not going to teach in German anymore. John found out. So they painted the schoolhouse yellow. If I were there, somebody would get tarred and feathered. Have you any suspicions? The boys here are all against mob rule, and there's talk of sending soldiers wherever they have trouble. Now, on the national level, we have the Espionage Act, making it illegal to interfere with the draft or encourage disloyalty, and the Sedition Act, you basically could not say anything negative about the U.S. going into the war. If you did, and somebody heard you, they could turn you in. You'd get arrested. So the Sedition Act is no longer law. The Espionage Act is still in place. That's why Edward Snowden, the whistleblower on the NSA, uh, lives in exile in Moscow. Now, an enterprising couple from Sioux Falls created this little toy cannon, and you could kill the Kaiser. And they, they drove all over the United States and sold these to make some money. Now, one of John's part-time jobs was delivering the mail. So his sister, Anna, paid $75 for a horse and buggy. And she took over his mail route. She might have been the first woman in America to have a mail route. And they're looking at that family picture that I showed you at the beginning. Now, his pastor took out a large yellow legal pad, put it in a typewriter, single space letter. The whole, you listen to me, Jake? Single space letter from his pastor, and in the in the letter, he's explaining to him, you know, that over the centuries, what Christ, what the Christian Church has determined is that there are instances when we have to go to war, and a Christian can go to war. That's a just war. So we wanted John to know that it was okay. Unfortunate, but it's something we have to do once in a while. So we got great support from, you know, not just his family, but uh, people in the community. Here he is with his World War One era Bible. Now, uh, we're on our way in the United States to Prohibition, the 18th Amendment. When John went off to war, he was all excited. He was in favor of prohibition. Now, something happened to change his mind. Well, we've been over the top, and I'm writing this letter on a table in which probably a German officer ate, he ate his bread and drank this Rhine wine. When they left, they left quite a little wine behind. And I'm telling the world I forgot all about being a prohibition booster until I was reminded of it by the wine giving up. He took a liking with the German wine.
Now, the war ends on November 11th, which is why we're meeting today. Tomorrow is the 105th anniversary of that. Here's what he sees in the aftermath. Shot up horses, artillery plowed fields, poor old grandmothers, old men, crippled men, young but tired girls, hardly enough clothing to cover their legs. The Germans must and will pay for all of this, and we stay here until they do. Now, of all those atrocities we heard about in the propaganda, I haven't seen anything to corroborate that. But the natural horrors that follow war are horrors as you wouldn't believe without seeing. Now, back in Wentworth, the show Patriot, they were they hung up hung up an effigy of Kaiser Wilhelm and burned it on Main Street. Now, John was hoping he'd get home for Christmas in 1918, but because he could speak and write German fluently. He becomes part of the army of occupation. His job was to go knock on the door of a home and say to them, you're going to need to provide food and shelter for some American soldiers. He found them to be amazingly cooperative. They would all, you know, they'd be compensated for it. Now, as luck would have it, this is where he got to spend Christmas. In 1918, it has a a castle, a stone bridge, goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. And the family that he stayed with had an extensive wine-making business. They had agents in the United States. They'd won contests in St. Louis. So, he says, one sure way of insulting a Sarburger is to be caught drinking water. <laughs> If wine like that could be had at home instead of rotten whiskeys, there never would be any prohibition talk. <laughs> one enjoys wines here for they do not make one dizzy or give you a headache the morning after. I believe he's speaking from experience. <laughs> we have wine with our meals, wine in between, and it's old wine, rich and mellow. Never had anything like it at home. Now his sister, that was it was too much. She goes, why don't you get your picture taken now in Germany? Ma wants to know if you're so big that you can't get in the picture anymore. I'd rather you talk a little less about that darn wine. Don't you know that we can't get any here? And besides, Mama worries because she's afraid you drink too much. Bottle in one hand, glass in another, backup bottle nearby. <laughs> he did say he put on 30 pounds during the occupation. And he did write a letter. I wonder if I'll be able to go without drinking when I get home. His granddaughters contacted me the day before the final manuscript was due. We just found a bunch of photos of John in Germany. Can you get those in the book and got them in? Now, the bond between Anna and John was very deep. It's Christmas Day. I imagine that she finds a quiet corner in the house after all the festivities, and she writes this. Very poignant letter. Well, dear, I do hope you've had a Merry Christmas. Sometimes I wonder how Christmas can be merry this year, how scattered our bunch is, how scattered all over the whole world. And yet, in a way, nearer than ever. In a way, I should be the happiest creature alive, and yet I ain't. My heart has been so close to my mouth all day that I've been afraid to open my mouth. Well, maybe I'll have reason to be truly happy real soon. I hope so. Now for our Christmas, I decorated the room and the tree as usual, except that I put the large Christmas wreath around our beloved service flag. The children were, of course, quite delighted, but I believe we all left felt the absence of some important factor. I wanted a letter from you so bad today, but none came. Don't see why you don't write. We've only received one letter since November 11th. The program was all in American. The days of worshiping in German were over. 
and not as good as usual as they didn't have much time to practice because of the flu. Public events were canceled. People were encouraged to stay home and wear masks. Sounds familiar. We'll have a party either Sunday or New Year, but better come over for it. I shouldn't enjoy it much, but must do something to get the discontent and longing out of my system. Well, so much of myself. Wish I were in a happier state of mind, but alas, how am I to be? There is no place like home, but it's lonesome as home when they aren't all home. Well, so long, kid, do wish you'd write, and just dying by inches to hear from you. Yours with love and kisses. I tell my students, this is what 19-year-olds wore 100 years ago. This is Anna. On the back, she said, this will give you an idea of how stuck up I look since I'm working for Uncle Sam. Aha. Uh -huh. I guess you, I guess I have my head up too high anyway. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, what are you doing now? I suppose you've made a list of every French girl you saw. Aha. Uh -huh. Your pictures haven't come yet. Be sure and send us the address of the place. Dad is hauling in alfalfa hay today. And it's dandy. Crops look good. We have the best corn for miles around. Now, the letters he wrote from the Western Front, the penmanship, you might imagine, is a bit hairy, sloppy. This is his letter to his mom on Mother's Day, and it's like a piece of art. It's like the finest calligraphy. <clears throat> Dear Mother, today is Mother's Day again, only a year, Mother dear, since I wrote the last Mother's Day letter, but what a year! Soon! Just about three more weeks, we will celebrate a real Mother's Day. But today, I must tell you, Mother dear, that it was memories of you that made training easy and endurable. Memories of you that gave me the backbone and the courage when we went up to the front. Memories of you that made it possible to face hell itself and your prayers that made it possible for me to come through this hell nearly without a scratch. And after the armistice, it was again you, Mother, who has kept me on the straight and narrow path as much as a human being can. I can't ever begin to thank you, and I'm not going to try. But when I have returned, I will show my appreciation to the best mother in the world. As things have changed there, so have I changed. All of us who face powder in a small cab. But I'm sure, mother, you have a son with whom you can be satisfied. He has learned much and has grown 20 years older in thoughts and habit. He sure has been has seen 20 years go by in 12 short months. So I said, do you have a, a picture of Dora? How about her reading a letter from John? Okay, here we go. Now you'll notice she's sitting on cement steps. So this is John, John's son. Marvin, and that this is Leona, his daughter in law. First 10 years when I told the story, everywhere I went, Fargo, Pier, Aberdeen, wherever, they would pack up their Cadillac with all the memorabilia and they would drive and meet me. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they're both past now. Now, we found out that. Some of his letters were being published in the newspapers, like the Sioux City Journal. And he did not like it. He says, do not do that. I don't want other people reading my letters. I'm not that great a writer. It's against the rules and regulations. So, should his son and daughter-in-law left the pile as it was, because he wrote private, not for public view. So what do you think? Did they make the right decision to let's, let me tell the story? I think you know what I think, but what do you think? Did they make the right decision? Well, history asks 
for yeah. his, for his, I don't know, that's, that's a tough one. Yeah. So you saw at the end, um, he died in 1952. This is like 2002, 2003. And so Marvin said, if dad was alive today, he'd be happy that his story is being told. Now, despite not being a great writer, he starts a newspaper. So here you can see Wentworth, grass grows on the main street. Contrast that with Sarberg, Germany. Unfortunately, back then, um, working at a newspaper aggravated a condition that was plaguing his lungs since he'd been exposed to poisonous gas. Now, years later, I found, well, here, let me start with that over again. So he kept a pocket diary while he was in Germany, and he had people sign their names in it. And I saw the name Matilda Kaiser. Now, now it's the late 40s, World War II is over, and they're living in the American sector of the divided Germany, and I was surprised. They weren't starving, but they didn't have enough food to eat. So they write and tell him. And what he does is he boxes up food, you know, stuff you can mail, like canned meats, that type of thing. And he sends them to this German family. And they're just so grateful. See, so he went off to kill the Huns. But now, late 1940s, he's achieved a sense of reconciliation and he's sending food to his former enemies. So there are two Odysseys, going off to war and returning, hating your enemy, and then loving them. He had a hairstyle that's very popular right now. <laughs> there he is with his wife. So what happens is the chemicals aggravate that condition of his lung and he dies in 1952 at the age of 57. Brother, his sister Hannah, John and Ida, his wife and John. Now, in 2018, um, Private Warren still has two daughters who are alive. They're in their 80s. Now they're probably 90. And he has two granddaughters who never met him. So they've gotten a book about the grandfather they never met. And so his uh, daughter, Anne, heard the presentation back in 2004, and she heard me read that Mother's Day letter. So she wrote to me and said, because of my dad's war experiences, my childhood was tough. I was only 14 when he died. As an adult in 2004, listening to you read his Mother's Day letter to my grandmother, Dora Warrens, and later receiving a copy of the letter you read, God gave me a special gift in knowing and coming to understand my dad as a person of compassion and profound integrity. The added blessing, the special gift from the Holy Spirit, is the emotional healing I've received, bringing me to forgiving my dad from my heart. So a lot of people get to write books. I got to write a book that helped me. Yeah. Emotionally. We're going to take some questions from online first. Yes. Okay. Actually, we wanted to do in the room first. Okay. And then, um, yeah, and our online people can. Um, I'm trying to say if you all should 
type out your questions or, or, or unmute. I think I think we'll have you unmute. Um, so let's try to see if anyone in the room has a question first. Maybe Jeremy can moderate that and then um, we can't see the audience, so you'll you'll just have to tell us. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, why didn't the, the nonpartisan league do better in South Dakota? Well, let's see, the governor at the time is Peter Norbeck, and he's the guy that helped get Mount Rushmore going and tourism in the Black Hills. And he was dead set against having the NDL come in. And his opponent in 1918 was Bates, the Democrat, and that's who the NPL endorsed. So what they did is they linked the NPL to the radical Bolshevik revolution, which was bogus. I mean, the leaders in North Dakota were not in contact with Lenin and Trotsky, but that was how they smeared it. So they were they were labeled disloyal. And then when they tried to meet in places in South Dakota, they, they were denied peaceable assembly. So they never got much accomplished in South Dakota. In North Dakota, they did. They got a state bank, the state mill and elevator. They elected a governor. So it was a very, for a few years there, it was a very vibrant, uh, insurgent democratic movement, which said, look, what's the difference if you get kicked in the head by a donkey or an elephant sits on you? If neither the Republicans or the Democrats are doing us any good. So rather than form another party, let's try to find candidates that we can endorse that will push our agenda. But the obstacles they faced in South Dakota, I think, were just too difficult to get to make much headway. They were basically, they tried to come in at Britain up in the north central part and they were just ran out of town. Anyone else here? If I'm not mistaken, it said that in 1917 was prohibition. And then it said 1918, nobody was supposed to speak badly about the country. That doesn't sound like a democracy to me. Well, that's a good point. Um, a lot of people pointed out the irony in making, in claiming to make the world safer democracy when you couldn't exercise free speech at home. And then there was, you know, half of our population, women, said, marched, picketed in front of the White House, and when arrested, even we were willing to go on hunger strikes in prison. And they said, well, if we're going to go to war to make the world safer democracy, Maybe you should give us the right to vote here. So that helped them get the 19th Amendment passed in 20, 1920. What were they doing to people that spoke against the country? Um, you could go to prison. And we had at least three camps in the United States where this people who were considered disloyal were sent and they were incarcerated for the entire war. There was one in Georgia, one in Carolina, one of the Carolinas, and one in Utah. And virtually nobody knows anything about them. I'm trying to find out about them. I want to research and write about it, but I can't find the information. So, for example, if you were from Germany and you were visiting the United States in April of 1917, when we went to war, you might have been on a ship waiting to go back to Germany. You ended up in one of those camps. And you spent the duration of the war there. So the, the Wilson administration wanted everyone to be on board. Complete support of the war. We're not going to tolerate any dissent. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll put all the constitutional rights, all the basic rights, put them on the back burner. And when the war is over, we can go back to that. So it was a one writer said it was the most egregious attack on American civil liberties in our entire history. I, 
I've never heard of that before. And that side of the war, that side of it really fascinates me. So locally, we had people in the Hutterite colony, in the Rockport colony, and three of them got drafted, and they were pacifists. So they got on a train in Mitchell. They got into a berth by themselves. The other guys broke in and shaved their beards off. They got to Fort Lewis, Washington for basic training. They said, we're pacifists. We, we won't even sweep the floor for wash and ditch. And the guy goes, well, the commander goes, actually, you're a U.S. soldier. You got drafted. So they ended up in Alcatraz. And they were, since they wouldn't wear a uniform, all they let them wear was underwear. And then they were handcuffed and stretched up so that their feet barely touched the floor. And after the war, they were transferred to Fort Leavenworth. And one for sure, maybe two died there. I forget. I know one for sure. Where do we read that in history? Um, there's a good book about it called Pacifists and Chains, okay. written by um, a Mennonite scholar. I can't remember his name, but. It's also mentioned in the uh, PBS documentary on World War One. They, they have that story. They're they're buried in the colony graveyard with the the word martyr on their cross crosses. Anybody else here have a question? How about from online? Do we have any questions? Okay. Zoom participants, if anybody has a question, go ahead and unmute. Um, I, and yeah, I, I have a question. Yeah, um, you know, when you talked about uh, th this fellow uh, getting um, lung disease because of toxic exposures to gas. But I also noticed he was smoking a pipe. So to what extent, and maybe you can't answer it, but to what extent do you think the increased amount of smoking that occurred uh, in conjunction with World War I and then definitely into World War II, uh, well, which would make any underlying condition a lot worse? Right. Um, well, there's no question it didn't help. And, you know, even through World War II, soldiers got issued cigarettes like you would get issued everything else. It was just considered something that you could do. And there wasn't a whole lot of awareness at that time of, about the connection between smoking and disease. So I, you know, we had to kind of skim some of the letters tonight, but he, there is a letter where he, you know, he repeatedly requested that tobacco smoke be sent to him because he was smoking a pipe to relieve stress. So I'm quite sure that it it contributed to you know what ultimately killed him. Do we have other questions from our online participants? Okay, well, while you all are thinking of questions, I will ask one. So how many letters do you think are were there altogether? Um, now you had to well, skim over for, for time, right? Yeah, well, the, the total collection is around 200. Wow. So for those of you who are not historians, this is, this is um, let me see, Rich is living the historian dream. I just have this kind of a treasure trove just fall into your lap. I mean, I would have thought that that was a dream that never happened if I hadn't heard your story. <laughs> so, yeah, this is really a, a, an amazing find. And also um, just a really a big testament to that family to have kept all of those, um, the letters, the pictures, but also uh, helmets, everything, right? They kept everything that had to do with 
with John's experience. Yeah, they were just like. They were meticulous keepers of records. They were meticulous. Well, they were historians themselves. Right. And um, so maybe some of you have family treasure troves like that at uh, at your homes or um, at your relatives' homes. And um, I would be remiss as part of the State Historical Society not not to mention that um, we love those kinds of collections and we have archive and museum collections. And um, if you have something that, that you think belongs in the archives um, or in the museum, um, please reach out to us. We have a wonderful staff who would, who would be happy to, to, to get that into a home where it can be preserved. Um, and that's that's kind of the thing that starts happening with materials that are over 100 years old that they need to be in acid-free environments where they're temperature controlled so they don't disintegrate. Although the paper is a lot thicker generally <laughs> from earlier days. So so this is just such an amazing um, just walk through history in this that you have also that you have both sides of the correspondence so we can see um, what John was saying in in reply to his family and um, to his sister. And wow, and she is just something. Somebody needs to write a history book about Anna. Yes, and I also wanna give Rich Loftus a chance to tell us how you can, can get his book. His book is not a, a South Dakota Historical Society Press book, but is readily available um, in everywhere books are sold. Also, uh, we do have it available at the Historical Society on our at our heritage store. Um, you can shop online as sdhsf, as in foundation.org. And I think it's backslash store. <laughs> and, and also, I'm sure any, I've seen Rich's book on Amazon. I'm sure it's in lots of different places as well.